Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening for the second session of our Ovarian Cancer Wellness Symposium. I am very excited to have Dr. Robert Copeland Halperin from Northwell Health joining us this evening to talk about the important topic of heart health in ovarian cancer. I would like to share with you a little bit about Dr. Copeland Halperin. He is an assistant professor at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell Health, where he serves as the director of cardio-oncology for the Northwell Health healthcare system. Dr. Copeland Halperin is a native New Yorker and a graduate of Hamilton College. He completed a post-bachelorate program at Columbia University and a medical degree at the Icahn School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. He trained in internal medicine and cardiology at Mount Sinai Hospital and cardio-oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Copeland Halperin's research has been published in peer-reviewed scientific journals, including Audiosclerosis Thrombosis and Vascular Biology, the Journal of the American Heart Association, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, the American Journal of Cardiology, and JAMA Oncology. Dr. Copeland Halpern is Fellow of the American College of Cardiology and serves on the American College of Cardiology's Cardio-Oncology Leadership Council. And we are very privileged to have him here with us this evening to talk about this important topic that several of you bring up in our Teal Hearts Network support groups. So I would like to now turn our presentation over to Dr. Copeland Halpern. Please give him a warm welcome. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie, for the introduction. Thank you all for uh, joining us this evening. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Let's make sure it's working. Is that working, Stephanie? Yes, that looks fantastic. Okay, great. Um, well, anyway, you know, I'm just so delighted to be here with you um, to uh, have what I hope will be sort of an informal discussion, but I did prepare uh, some slides as well uh, to talk about cardio-oncology in general, but also uh, some specific uh, issues related to uh, ovarian cancer. So I have a grant from the Medtronic company uh, to study arrhythmia in patients uh, on chemotherapy, but it's not really uh, relevant to this talk um, and uh, won't be discussing uh, any of this uh, uh, this evening. So for tonight, first, I'm going to give a general overview about the important connection between cancer and heart disease. And I'll talk about uh, specific cardiac side effects of uh, some of the common cancer therapies for all different types of cancer, um, not just ovarian cancer. But then I will spend some time on specific treatments used for ovarian cancer that have important cardiac uh, side effects um, that I think everyone should know about and hopefully uh, we can help with. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what I do in cardio-oncology um, and also uh, present some resources uh, for more information at the end. So there are a number of observations that have shown that cancer patients have an increased risk of heart disease. And this is just one large study um, that I like to cite because it's so huge. Um, it had over uh, 3 million uh, US cancer patients uh, who were diagnosed all the way from the 70s until uh, 2012. And, but this is just one example. There's many studies, and I'm sure you are all aware of this already, that cancer patients have an increased risk of heart disease, strokes, heart attacks, um, and death from cardiovascular disease. And in fact, it's you know, uh, a leading cause of death in cancer patients of all different kinds of cancer types. So these are mortality ratios relative to the US population for patients with cancer of all these different sites. And what's interesting to see here is that it's a bimodal sort of uh, distribution. There's an increased risk of heart disease within the first year of diagnosis. And then it kind of levels out a little bit, but then again, it starts to increase 
after about five years. So what this tells us is that there's an initial increased risk during the first year, probably during the treatment. And then again, a later risk for the survivors about five years down the line. Um, and you know, this becomes very important for when we think about the connection between heart disease and cancer. So conventionally, we've thought that the reason for the increased risk of heart disease in cancer patients has to do with the following factors. Well, first of all, there's similar risk factors, right? Smoking, maybe a sedentary lifestyle, obesity, probably some genetics that uh, are involved in both. And then we know that chemotherapy and radiation can affect the heart. We've known this for many decades. So part of the cancer treatment uh, has implications on the heart and blood vessels. And uh, we're gonna talk a bit about that specifically today. But also there are factors related to cancer itself which cause heart disease. As you, any of you unfortunately know, when you're getting chemotherapy, you have a lot of fatigue and decreased energy. And so you're much more sedentary. You're not exercising as, and as active as much, which we know increases the risk of heart disease. And cancer also increases the risk for blood to clot, which we know is involved in heart disease. And also inflammation uh, is increased in cancer, which we know contributes to heart disease. So this was the sort of traditional paradigm. And in ovarian cancer, we don't have a lot of data on the specific incidence of different heart disease risks. Actually, you know, relative to other cancers, ovarian cancer is not necessarily the one with the highest risk of heart disease. But probably part of that is that we don't have a lot of complete information. This is just a um, study that came out of the UK a few years ago, showing that there was an increased risk of various different sort of categories of, of heart disease, either uh, clots, inflammation of the heart, arrhythmia, rhythm problems, or vascular, which means like strokes and heart attacks. And you know, what you should take note of here is that, okay, clots and embolism was pretty high risk, maybe six times as high as a person without ovarian cancer of the same age and other risk factors. But things like heart attacks and strokes were maybe, you know, uh, 1.25 times as high as a, con you know, a control patient. And also the confidence bounds around this, this here are wide, which means that we don't really know because they don't, they need more information. This means that it could be anywhere in here, even less. <laughs> so, but um, I think that, you know, this uh, is probably due to the fact that we just don't have as much information about ovarian cancer as we do for cancers like breast cancer that are more common. But certainly one of the important risks that seems to emerge with ovarian cancer is an increased risk of blood clots, which will become important for some of the medicines that we're gonna talk about this evening. And um, this is just different cancer types and their incidence of blood clots, looking at a large administrative uh, database and as you can see, ovarian cancer patients, 11% uh, of them in this uh, database actually were diagnosed with a blood clot. So we know that cancer patients have an increased risk of heart disease, but what's become apparent is that heart disease is also a risk factor for cancer. And this is a study of patients who have heart failure, which is a weakening of the heart muscle. So the heart does not pump blood as strong. And in heart failure patients, even across the entire spe spectrum of different ages, these colors and the dashes represent the, um, the background population in the dash and the solid is the heart failure patients and the different colors are different ages. But all age groups, patients with this heart condition have a higher risk of developing cancer. So there's something beyond just the chemotherapy that is connecting these two conditions. Another observation that I think is very interesting is something called CHIP, which is clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. So what this is are a series of uh, mutations that are present in blood cells. 
And they happen to be found sort of sporadically as people age due to environmental changes, uh, you know, other factors that cause there to be mutations in the genes of our blood cells. And over age 70, about 10 to 20% of people will have one of these. And that doesn't mean that they have necessarily any cancer or any problem, but these mutations have been associated with a very small risk of progression to a leukemia, for example. So maybe the risk of having a leukemia, if you have one of these mutations, is maybe one or two percent over a year, pretty small, nothing to worry about. But there, it turns out that if you have these mutations, the risk of developing heart disease, like a heart attack or a stroke, is 40% higher, and that's independent of whether you have high blood pressure, smoking, diabetes, high cholesterol, family history. So it independently predicts the risk of heart disease. If you just have one of these mutations that we know is somewhere on the continuum of blood cancers. So what we're really coming to understand increasingly is that there's a bi-directionality between cancer and heart disease, that heart disease can cause cancer and cancer can cause heart disease. And this is related to myriad different factors, the common risk factors that we discussed, common mechanisms like you know blood clotting and inflammation, which are common to both. There are factors that are present in heart disease and actually um, found increased in the blood in the setting of high blood pressure, which if you put those factors in the, that are found in the blood of people with hypertension, if you put those factors in a Petri dish with tumor cells, the tumor cells grow and they metastasize. So when you think about this, we're really on a biological level, almost dealing with uh, the same pathophysiology. And so patients who have heart disease and uncontrolled risk factors may potentially you know, be increasing the risk of tumor progression and cancer. And patients with cancer, as we know, uh, have a much higher risk of developing cardiovascular complications, which not only can cause, uh, you know, debility and mortality, but also can compromise their ability to get the most effective treatment for their cancer. These are sort of the most um, important types of cancer therapies that have been associated with heart disease. And I won't spend too much on this today because I want to get into the stuff that is specific to ovarian cancer. But I'm sure many of you have friends or relatives uh, who may be going through their own battles. And so I think it's just important to be educated about what the most cardiac risky uh, cancer treatments are. The classic is the anthracyclines, you know, the red devil, uh, it's also called uh, adriamycin or doxorubicin. Um, it's most often used in ovarian cancer in the form of doxel, which is a liposomal form, which is actually a, quite a bit safer for the heart, but still requires monitoring. And Herceptin is used uh, primarily in breast cancer and then also some GI cancers as well. And uh, this is also associated with heart damage. Immunotherapy, which is used for numerous different types of cancers um, and probably will be soon uh, used for ovarian cancer as well, uh, is associated with important cardiac side effects. And then there's a whole host of targeted therapies, which I'm um, sure many of you are uh, familiar with, that are uh, either IV infusions or oral medicines that are taken uh, to target specific receptors on cancer cells. Uh, and they're used for a number of different uh, conditions. The most important one uh, for ovarian cancer is a medicine called Avastin or Bevacizumab, which we'll talk about um, in just a few minutes. And then of course, uh, radiation can affect the heart and blood vessels as well. And this is something that was a much bigger problem for people who were treated in uh, you know, the 80s and 90s, because there's been a lot of advances in the shielding that's used now and in the way that the radiation is delivered. So it's much safer than it used to be, but patients um, who received radiation, radiation to the chest um, or to the mantle field for like Hodgkin's lymphoma um, definitely have a significantly increased risk of heart disease. And um, you know, uh, it really affects uh, their life 10 to 20 years 
after their cancer is cured. So let's pause a minute and talk about Avastin. So Avastin is uh, among the uh, targeted therapies known as a vascular endothelial growth factor inhibitor. And this medicine works by inhibiting a receptor on cancer cells that promotes blood vessel formation. So cancer cells um, need to proliferate and grow and take over the healthy cells and the way that they do that is by developing food supply, which is basically blood vessels to help them grow and uh, promote their growth. And certain cancers uh, particularly depend on this mechanism a lot. And ovarian cancer is one of them. And so this medication inhibits that vascular endothelial growth factor that's present on the cancer cells. But this receptor is also present on other healthy tissues and is involved in homeostasis of our own blood vessels and in the regulation of our blood pressure and our kidney function. And as a result, Avastin has been associated with um, increased risk of uh, the following issues. Number one, high blood pressure, which is very common in patients on Avastin and other medicines that act on VEGF, and also can cause kidney damage partly as a result of the high blood pressure, which can affect the kidneys, but also because of direct effects on the, uh, the kidney filtration system, leading to protein being released in the urine, and can, that can cause kidney damage. And also there's an increased risk for blood clots uh, and uh, clots that can go to the lungs with uh, Avastin. In terms of how common high blood pressure is, well, these are data from the sort of initial studies that were done uh, in patients with ovarian cancer to see if Avastin would improve the tumor response and, um, and the uh, progression-free survival. So these are the first four uh, sort of seminal studies uh, testing Avastin and the different regimens used. And as you can see, across the board, compared to the control arm, which here was uh, you know, conventional chemotherapy with Paxol um, and, and carboplatin um, or gemcitabine and carboplatin, uh, the risk of uh, hypertension was much greater uh, in the patients treated with Avastin. And it tends to occur sort of early on in treatment, but it can occur later as well. Up to you know, 40%, even more of the patients uh, who didn't have high blood pressure before wound up getting uh, high blood pressure uh, that required treatment or an adjustment of the, uh, of the treatment regimen uh, during these studies. Another important class of medications which is used for ovarian cancer and also breast cancer are PARP inhibitors. And these are inhibitors of uh, the polyadenosine diphosphate ribose polymerase enzymes that are involved in normal and healthy cell function and also DNA transcription and repair. And it's felt that um, a number of tumors have mutations in the, uh, their DNA repair pathways that causes them to become malignant and gives them uh, rise to the proliferation and the growth that makes them become cancer as opposed to healthy cells. The protective mechanisms that repair the errors in the DNA um, that prevent the cells from going high haywire are, uh, are abnormal or mutated. And this is part of the mechanism for patients who have uh, BRCA-positive breast cancer. And so if they knock out the, uh, the PARP inhibitor in those cells, they can then basically cause those cells to be completely not viable. So as opposed to just going wild, they're basically not compatible with ongoing cell survival. And that's the mechanism by which knocking out the other DNA repair mechanism uh, is felt to uh, um, target the cancer. And these are um, used less commonly than Avastin. They're approved for patients with relapsed ovarian cancer that's been responsive previously to platinum chemotherapy so that they had shown that the tumor had shrunk and now uh, they will uh, receive the PARP inhibitor as a maintenance treatment after that. There's three of them that are approved in the US. 
And they're also been studied in prostate and breast cancer, uh, partly uh, in BRCA positive breast cancer patients and uh, in patients with um, uh, androgen sensitive uh, prostate cancer. The most common side effects of these are nausea and of course fatigue, which any medicine can do. Um, and there's a small risk of bone marrow problems like uh, you know, pre-leukemia uh, states and myelodysplastic syndrome being the most important. And these are very rare, but it's kind of interesting when you think about what we know about pre-leukemic uh, changes and cardiovascular disease. So far, PARP inhibitors appear pretty safe actually in terms to cardiovascular events. In the studies with patients with ovarian cancer, the risk for uh, cardiac events like heart attacks or blood clots was only slightly higher than in the placebo arm, maybe 1.5% compared to 1% or 3.5% you know, you know, versus uh, you know, 3%. So definitely a small increase, but not uh, anything that would raise eyebrows. But when they did a study of o Olaparib, which is called Limparza in patients with prostate cancer, so this is not ovarian cancer, but in patients with prostate cancer who were also receiving uh, a medicine called abiraterone, uh, which helps to block uh, testosterone hormones, the risk for blood clots, which is what venous thromboembolic events are, and also a blood clots that go to the lung, pulmonary embolism, was much higher with Limparza than with placebo. So this is why the, uh, the labeling and on the websites for these medicines, they'll talk about the risk of blood clots and why I think it bears keeping in mind because there's probably a signal for this here. Um, and you know we need to be vigilant for it as we get more experience with these medicines. So what is cardio-oncology? So cardio-oncology is a new field of cardiology. I trained as a cardiologist, not as an oncologist, um, but uh, given what's been become apparent about the risk of heart disease in cancer and cancer patients and the risks of the specific chemotherapies that we've mentioned and all of these new uh, drugs coming out all the time, it's given rise to a new specialty that is basically focused on cancer patients and um, preventing uh, heart disease in, uh, in patients during their cancer treatment and then at, after treatment in the survivors. And what we do is basically work to optimize risk factors uh, prior to starting treatment and to manage any cardiac side effects or toxicity that may occur. And through screening mechanisms that we have with imaging and blood tests, we've developed ways that we can often detect changes in the heart before they cause symptoms and therefore intervene with protective uh, interventions uh, that will enable the patient to go on to continue their treatment successfully um, without developing a heart toxicity. And that's the most exciting sort of aspect of what I do. And this is a great example of that. I'm really proud of this work that I did with my mentor, Anthony Yu at Memorial Sloan Kettering. This is a study looking at patients with breast cancer who got the drug called Herceptin. And we had 1400 patients who were treated there. And what we found was that patients who had to have the treatment interrupted because there was a change in their heart function or there was some concern about maybe that they were developing a heart problem during their monitoring. For whatever reason, the patients who had an interruption in the treatment had a worse recurrence-free survival than the patients who were able to continue the treatment uninterrupted. So that is not only did they um, live longer, but they uh, were free of breast cancer recurrence longer compared to the group that had interruptions, which kind of makes sense if you think about it, like, duh, the patient has less chemo, they're going to get more cancer. But what you have to keep in mind is that patients with, who are being treated with Herceptin are being monitored by 
echocardiograms every three months and they might not have any symptom, but maybe the test looks a little funny or maybe there's a suggestion that it's worse than it was three months ago. And so the oncologist says, let's hold the treatment and go see a cardiologist and get this figured out. But it turns out that just holding the treatment is not so benign and it may have impacts on the patient's uh, chance of a successful cure. And so while we haven't been able to demonstrate this in ovarian cancer or in other contexts, unfortunately, I think this concept is really important. And I often uh, try to apply this reasoning uh, in my approach to patients that if we can enable the patients to continue the most effective cancer treatment safely and without heart damaging side effects, we'll improve not only you know, their risk of heart disease, but we'll improve the overall outcome and that the cancer will respond better as well. So how do we do this? So basically the way that we do cardio-oncology in my practice is a collaborative approach. We assess the baseline risk factors. Do you have high blood pressure, cholesterol, cigarette smoking? What's your family history? And um, do you have any history of heart disease to begin with? We can use biomarkers, which are blood tests that can detect early changes in the heart that occur before uh, symptoms. And we use imaging, usually an echo, which is a sonogram of the heart uh, to help assess the heart function. And depending on what the risks are or what the uh, specific situation is, we can then use medications, usually medicines that are used for high blood pressure, uh, to help to minimize the risk of developing uh, cancer damage. And this is most relevant to breast cancer, but when you think about things like Avastin, if you're coming in and starting treatment and the blood pressure is borderline or a little bit high or maybe a white coat kind of effect, you know, perhaps if we were able to intervene and get it under better control, we would reduce the risk of the pressure going up to a dangerous level during the treatment, having the treatment be interrupted, canceled, postponed, and then potentially improve the outcome for the patient. And lifestyle, of course, is fundamental to any doctor-patient relationship. You need to understand what people's home life is like, whether they're active physically, what their diet is like, and try to incorporate that as much as we can into what we do to improve the cardiovascular health. And all of this is a discussion, not just with me and the patient, but also with the oncologist or the radiation oncologists, um, patient's primary care doctor, or even their general cardiologist who doesn't necessarily have as much experience with cancer-related side effects. So we can all collaborate and come up with a plan that's best suited to the individual that we're uh, talking to. So I think I'm going to move on from this because we've sort of covered it, but these are uh, the kind of conditions that patients tend to be referred to me for, either for protection or specific chemos that need monitoring um, and uh, other symptoms uh, that may occur during their treatment, like palpitations or shortness of breath, chest pain. These are some helpful resources uh, for more information about cardio-oncology if you're interested. There's actually a society of cardio-oncology called ICOS, which is the International Cardio-Oncology Society. And they have a great website um, that actually has, depending on where you're located, um, a directory of uh, you know, cardio-oncology programs globally and uh, throughout the United States. So you can find people who are either trained in cardio-oncology or who have if they don't have specific fellowship training, have gone on to complete a certification exam and, and uh, are therefore uh, you know, certified by ICOS as an expert in uh, cardio-oncology. And they also have nice links to uh, the NIH's sites on uh, cancer and heart disease um, and also ASCO's uh, website. So this is a nice one to bookmark, ICOS, and it's uh, ic-os.org. So what do we do with all this information? The first thing I tell 
uh, patients is let's know the numbers. What is the risk factors that we're starting with going into the treatment, whatever it is? What's the blood pressure? What's the cholesterol? Do you have diabetes and has it been tested recently? Because, you know, what happens is you're going to all these appointments in the beginning and you've just got this diagnosis, which is life changing. And, you know, you have so much stuff that you have to get into a row that often what gets to the wayside is all of these things. And, you know, the oncologist has so much to go over with you and so much to discuss. And there's many questions that need to be addressed that oftentimes they don't have uh, any attention to pay to basic things that are easy to reduce the risk of a heart complication during cancer therapy, like the cholesterol numbers or the blood pressure. Second thing is, you know, you can't control the fact that you got cancer and it's not your fault, something that you did. And there's nothing you can do about the fact that uh, you may need chemotherapy or that uh, chemotherapy may have effects on the heart. It's not about avoiding treatment that's going to be beneficial because of a fear of heart disease. What we do is control everything that we can. What we can control is not smoking, staying active, uh, you know, keeping an attitude that uh, is positive about this in terms of what we can do to help and to enable uh, you to stay healthy and prevent heart disease. And to take a proactive approach to uh, these cardiac risk factors. It's just so easy to say, what's the point? I have cancer now, my blood pressure doesn't matter. But I would argue that not only does that uh, matter a lot, it has potential implications for the cancer's ability to get better and be cured by the treatment. And also we know that you know, high blood pressure may increase the risk for tumor progression in, in some situations. So it's important to make sure that these risk factors are mentioned and addressed to the extent that we can. And everything is a combination of lifestyle, diet, plus medications, and uh, you know, and exercise and nutritional things uh, in conjunction. Everything is done in parallel. And uh, to be vocal about how you might be able to reduce, reduce your risk of, uh, of cardiac complications during treatment should ask. And then oftentimes the oncologist will know uh, you know, local uh, resources, either cardio-oncologists or others that might be able to, uh, to guide you. And finally, you know, I just want to dedicate uh, the discussion today to my dear friend, Judith, who we sadly lost uh, a few years ago to ovarian cancer. Uh, she was a very close friend of uh, my whole family and just a wonderful soul a brilliant interior decorator and designer um, with uh, two uh, beautiful grandchildren. And, um, you know, I just uh, wanted to, to dedicate uh, this discussion uh, to her memory. Um, this is information about my practice. Uh, if you're interested or uh, wanna learn more about what we do at Northwell Cardio Oncology, we have this website and sorry for the long web link, but um, we have a nice web page also that has information about um, you know, heart risk and cancer. And uh, I'm also on Twitter if you want to follow along there. I often post uh, interesting studies uh, that are coming out in the uh, field of cardio-oncology um, and uh, would be very happy to uh, meet you on there as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to say thanks very much for your attention, and I really look forward to uh, an interesting discussion. Dr. Copeland Halperin, that was so insightful, and we really appreciate all of the knowledge that you just shared. So I am going to now um, ask some of the questions that are in the chat, and I would just like to say to everybody, um, I'm actually going to perfect um i just want to share with everybody we are going to again just be mindful that we want to um be respectful um that everybody's situation is unique the most important per people for you to go back to is your medical team and um so we're going to ask these as general as possible um and not be, be geared to um too specific to um what somebody might be going through so some of them you may have already answered but sometimes um 
a, a little repetition is good. What are the early signs that it should alert me to see a cardio oncologist? So the most um, you know, important thing, say if you've recently been diagnosed and you're going to be starting treatment, is if you have a history of heart disease um, in the past, even if you're seeing a cardiologist who you have a great relationship with, um, you know, you really want to um, think about speaking to someone with expertise in cardio-oncology because the underlying heart conditions um, may require adjustment in the management uh, depending on what kind of cancer treatments are planned. Second thing is um, if there's risk factors like family history or high blood pressure, diabetes, we know these increase the risk of heart complications in anybody, but especially in cancer patients, they really augment the risk of cardiac complications during treatment. And like I was saying before, you know, you got to control what you can control. You need to get the chemotherapy or the radiation or whatever the treatment is so that you can be alive and be healthy, beat the cancer. But if you have these risk factors that are getting ignored, you're leaving all this risk on the table that could easily be uh, addressed in a very straightforward way. So those are the sort of uh, early signs that um, you know you might want to uh, discuss cardio oncology care. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. How long after someone completes their treatment can cardiac issues appear? So um, that's a really great question. We have we traditionally thought that a lot of the cardiac side effects. Uh, from things like radiation, for example, tended to occur late. And so patients who had radiation would be fine, and then 20 years later, they would get a heart valve problem or a heart attack as a result of the radiation. But turns out that that's uh, really um, incomplete. And you know the heart disease risk is increased from the time of diagnosis forward, regardless of what the issue is, whether it's for the risk for arrhythmia, a blood clot, heart attack, heart uh, failure. From the time of diagnosis forward in numerous different uh, types of cancer, you see that increased risk. Um, and so I guess another uh, thing that you might be wondering from the way the question was asked is say that you've been treated and you've been in remission and you're feeling well, you know, when is it that you should consider getting a, a heart checkup? So what I usually recommend is at the end of your cancer treatment, uh, if you're fortunate enough to have completed treatment and to be in remission at that time, um, and now you're going to be followed with serial scans or, or, um, and follow up with the oncologist, that's a good time to get a heart checkup uh, at the end of the initial treatment. Um, and then at that point, we can make an assessment using the risk factors, what cancer treatments you were exposed to, and then come up with a personalized plan for how often we need to do some kind of screening. Um, or uh, how often you should be uh, you know, checking in with a cardiologist. So that's my recommendation. It's at the end of the initial treat cancer treatment. Okay, so at the end of the initial treatment is when you should see a cardio-oncologist if you have not been told to beforehand for other extenuating purposes. And I have a second part to that question. If so, for how many years should you continue seeing a cardio-oncologist? Even if you've graduated seeing, say, your um, medical oncologist after five years, do you continue on? If you've been in remission, how long should you continue to see a cardio-oncologist? So this really depends on the type of cancer and the risk. So what was the exposure? You know, patients who have received, you know, uh, adriamycin and radiation have a very high risk of heart disease. And so they need to be monitored very closely, even if they have no symptoms. But somebody who maybe got uh, you know, um, you know, six months of carbo and taxol and is now in remission and starting to rec recuperate and get back to you know, their, their regular life. At that point, I think we have an assessment, we meet at the end of the treatment, we, we, uh, we size up the risk, we have a discussion, and then we come up with a, an individualized uh, monitoring plan um, that may be, you know, once a year we see each other. It all sort of depends on what the exposure risk was and what the underlying risk is to determine how often they need to be uh, seen and followed up. Okay. Dr. Copenhagen, is there a theory why there is a large increase of cardiovascular disease five years post-treatment? 
Yeah, so that's, um, uh, you know, something that I think we don't know uh, completely, but it's believed to be a result of that's when the survivorship period starts. So in other words, the initial year of the diagnosis is when you're getting all of the treatment. And then after that, maybe the treatment worked, maybe it didn't, unfortunately. And there's other things that unfortunately increase the risk of death in patients like the cancer itself. But then at five years down the line, if you're still with us after your diagnosis from cancer, the competing risks, things other than cancer, begin to be the things that become important in terms of the risks of, of dying from them. So that's probably why at five years and beyond, the heart disease risk begins to predominate again. Okay. Next question is, um, should someone see a cardio-oncologist if they've been on medications such as Femera for 10 years with a history of hypertension? So, um, you know, I think that there any, almost any cancer agent that you look up the, you will find that there is some small risk of heart problems from it. And this is just because we're dealing with a high risk condition. The cancer itself is high risk and cancer patients get infections and all kinds of other things that can increase the risk of heart disease. And so, um, you know, uh, medications like Femara are definitely associated with an increased risk of cardiac complications, but it's not anything that I think you need to be running in fear to your heart doctor because you're in imminent danger from. You know, there's definitely increased risks if you look at the, the statistics, but a lot of that is sort of due to the fact that like there's risk factors that really weren't being well optimized and other factors that then add on to that uh, for many agents. You know, for things like uh, adriamycin or Herceptin, we know that they're really specific and or Avastin for that matter, really specific cardiac effects directly caused by that medicine, which increase the risk dramatically. But for things like Femara and other sort of hormonal therapies, um, you know, the risk is uh, more related to the, the other risk factors and the context than the, that particular agent itself. Okay, so with that also, I'm going to lead into the next question that um, somebody actually texted me was, if they were in surgical menopause as a uh, result, um, it went into surgical menopause, but did not need chemotherapy treatment, should they also seek uh, out a cardio-oncologist? So we know that, um, you know, the reduction in hormones and the changes that occur in estrogen levels during menopause increase the risk for uh, heart disease in the general population and um, are associated with changes in cholesterol levels and metabolism that we know promotes heart disease. So yeah, patients with surgical uh, menopause definitely are noted to have an increased risk in, uh, in, in cardiovascular disease. Um, and my advice about that is at the very minimum is to see an internist and make sure that your cholesterol, your diabetes, and your blood pressure are being addressed. And if there's uh, you know, any doubt that that's being done adequately, or if you feel that there are specific uh, you know, um, concerns uh, related to your family history uh, or any prior history or any symptoms, that's when uh, you know a cardio oncologist should really uh, you know be part of your team. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. The next question um, actually is: if somebody was physically active before they were diagnosed with cancer, then they um, had their diagnosis, are going through their treatments, and they still are trying to. Um, follow a good diet, stay in shape through exercise, does that help alleviate some of the cardiovascular disease? So the benefits of exercise and, um, and health are well recognized. And, you know, the U.S. Uh, Preventative Services Task Force recommends, you know, a regular exercise program for everybody regardless of what your underlying medical comorbidities are. They want everybody to do something up to their own abilities. And if you're healthy, you should be doing 30 minutes, you know, uh, at least, you know, five to seven days a week of vigorous, you know, moderate intensity exercise 
you know, um, like, like jogging or, uh, or something like that. So we know that exercise is uh, associated with myriad benefits. And, you know, for this reason, we recommend a regular aerobic exercise program you know, in all patients and particularly in cancer patients, there's a lot of studies that have shown that exercise can improve other markers like, you know, your mood, your sense of well-being, can improve sleep and energy levels and reduce symptoms and the, uh, uh, and the side effects, uh, you know, of uh, fatigue and things like that that are associated with cancer therapy. Um, and we also know that patients who exercise have less risk of heart disease. Um, and that um, patients who report exercising more at the beginning of their treatment are less likely to go on and develop a cardiac complication during the treatment. And this has been shown in numerous contexts. But you gotta, you know, be a little careful because what that's really just telling us is that there's an association, right? Those who are able to exercise or who are motivated to exercise do better than those who can't. And so we don't really have in the same way that we have for, um, you know, uh, certain cancer treatments or for, you know, medications for heart uh, condition, for example, where the endpoint is, you know, one person gets the placebo, one person gets the intervention and you see who does better at the end. Um, and it's, you know, and it's controlled like that. We don't really have those kind of studies on exercise, unfortunately. Um, and this is a big gap in, uh, you know, in this area. But despite all that, because of all of the observations, not just on reduced risk of heart events, or even if we don't have, you know, um, the kind of high quality, you know, randomized studies that we would want for another kind of intervention, it's clear that exercise has myriad benefits on symptoms, mood, and overall well being. And there is a lot of observations that suggest it reduces heart disease risk as well. So I think you definitely can uh, hang your hat on that. And yes, reduces your risk of a cardiac complication on that basis. Thank you very much for uh, enlightening us with that fact. But ladies, always remember, before you go back into the world of exercise, after you're going through treatment, moderation is key. <laughs> you do not go back to a cut fitness right away. <laughs> um, can you discuss the role of thrombocytosis and cancer and any cardiovascular risk this may pose? You mean like uh, essential thrombocythemia, like high platelets, um, that, 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 that specific condition? Uh, actually, yes. yeah. there you go, yes. <laughs> yeah, so um, this goes back to the the issue with the chip mutation. So yeah, there's definitely an increased risk in uh, essential uh, thrombocytosis of uh, heart attacks and strokes and blood clots. Um, and it's probably related to, uh, you know, this continuum that we've seen between uh, pre-leukemic uh, mutations in blood cells and uh, cardiovascular disease risk. Um, we know that, you know, uh, the cells like platelets and white blood cells are implicated in the pathophysiology of uh, heart attacks, causing the blockages in the blood vessels. And so uh, the, abnorm the abnormalities that lead to the uh, thrombocytosis uh, also increase the risk of heart disease. So it's definitely something that uh, you, know, you should uh, discuss uh, with uh, you know, your provider. And you know, these are patients that you know, I often think about putting empirically on uh, cholesterol lowering medications to lower the risk uh, because it is so much higher compared to the general population. It really is a significant risk marker. Okay, the next question, timing is everything. Um, we have somebody that's with us th tonight that is actually going to see a cardiologist for the first time as a result of an irregular EKG in addition to cholesterol being slightly elevated. Um, they are an active and fit person. What specific questions should they be asking? So the first uh, thing is, is symptoms. When it comes to abnormalities in the EKG, you know, symptoms is sort of the most important thing. And, it, you know, you really want to um, be vocal about any symptoms that you're having, like palpitations, chest pain, shortness of breath, swelling, uh, decreases in your exercise capacity. 
those are the things that are uh, important to bring up. Um, if the uh, cholesterol is slightly high, things that you wanna know are, what are your other risk factors for uh, heart disease? So we manage cholesterol now, not by looking at the numbers anymore, we look at the risk. So if somebody has a history of multiple quadruple bypasses and the cholesterol is perfect, they still need to be on a cholesterol lowering medication because their risk of heart disease will be significantly reduced by that medicine. And they should be on a high dose of medicine. It doesn't matter that the cholesterol is, is normal because they have such a high risk, they'll do better on the cholesterol medicine. The flip side of that is somebody who's got high cholesterol and they eat right, they're doing everything they can, but they just can't get that cholesterol down to below 130 or whatever we want. It's just slightly high and their blood pressure is normal. They've never smoked. They have no family history. You know, we don't need to be blasting people with a high dose of a cholesterol medicine just to get the numbers to turn from red to black on the doctor's screen if the other risks are low. So if you have borderline cholesterol, you want to ask about what is your 10-year ASCVD risk, which is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk, because that's how you determine the benefit that you will derive from uh, medicine to treat the cholesterol. And the other thing that you might ask is, what about a calcium score? And would a calcium score help make the decision? Okay, the next question, which I think is really important to share with everybody, um, might be a great question of how to um, close your presentation is, how come cardio-oncology consultation isn't standard of care for cancer patients? Uh, well, music to my ears, but you know, <laughs> I think that, look, you know, the point is resources. And you know, we have uh, a crisis uh, in this country of how much we spend on healthcare. Um, and we need to be uh, practical. Um, I think that as uh, experience expands, oncologists, especially those who trained recently and, and it, you know, are coming out of training at places that had you know, close collaboration and access to cardio-oncology, are increasingly seeing this as like a key part of the care team. And so as you go, you're going to meet the surgeon, you meet the medical oncologist, you meet the radiation oncologist, you'll meet the, uh, you know, um, the social worker or supportive care, like our palliative care people right up front. Also, cardio-oncology is increasingly part of that team right from the beginning. And I think that that's ideal, um, that there's at least a risk assessment and a discussion so we can customize things, you know, for the individual patient and their treatment plan right up front. But, you know, the issue is uh, we just do not have the resources uh, currently to make this mandatory for all cancer patients at this time. And also you mentioned about access to care. So Dr. Copeland Halpern, you had also um, mentioned to me that sometimes even if somebody doesn't have a cardio oncologist at the specific um, facility where they're getting treatment, there are still options where they can connect with somebody like yourself in this field. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely, Stephanie. And one of the things I like most about what I do is that, you know, uh, we can really use telehealth and sort of like, you know, um, remote uh, technology to add value in ways that are sort of different than, um, you know, conventional cardiology. So, you know, say you don't live any place near me or somebody with cardio-oncology expertise, or it's really difficult for you to travel, but you have a good local internist or a local cardiologist who does an EKG on you or can do some local blood work or testing, you know, we can have a discussion and can provide advice about the kinds of tests that might be useful for your particular situation, and you can have them done locally. Or if the cardiologist that you see has a question and they're just not as familiar with the specific chemo agent that you're on, you know, they could pick up the phone and talk to me about it and give them some advice and, uh, you know, and we can do things like that. It's not necessary for every patient to see me, uh, depending on what the issue is. And so I think that's really one of the most gratifying things about what I do as the system director at Northwell is I take care of patients all throughout, you know, five boroughs of New York, even if they can't travel to my office, we do telehealth with people in Westchester or Staten Island or New Jersey, um, or, uh, you know, even beyond, uh, because it's just too difficult for them to travel to the cancer center, but we can still uh, take care of their heart. 
Well, thank you. I, I do have one other question that just uh, came in. What are your thoughts on cardiac CT angiography for post-cancer patients as a screening tool? So, um, you know, it's always difficult to sort of give blanket statements about, you know, should every patient with cancer get a cardiac CT? I will say that it, you'd be hard pressed to find a cancer patient who hasn't had a CT scan, okay? And even on CT scans that aren't angiograms, like that means a CT angiogram is a, done with catheters and dye injected to a, a, a look specifically at the blood vessels. That's what the angiogram means. They use the contrast dye to look at the blood vessels. But even on a regular CT scan that's done with contrast uh, or even a non-con CT, you can determine if there's plaque in the blood vessels. And what we used to do at Memorial Sloan Kettering and what we do at Northwell is the radiologists are trained to mention on their report if they see atherosclerotic calcifications in the blood vessels. And just to put that there as a comment, because if you see that, that means that you have cardiovascular disease, you have got plaques in the arteries. And so I think, you know, a much better approach is that we should be paying more attention to those comments about the heart and blood vessels that we have on the CT scans that are already being done for the cancer patients, rather than, uh, you know, trying to uh, perform new CT angiograms on, uh, on cancer patients to evaluate the arteries, um, you know, in, as a general sort of approach. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Copeland Halpern. This has been extremely insightful and informative. Um, if there are other questions that you have that those have attended that um, are still coming into the chat, you could send them to me and I will ask Dr. Copeland Halpern and then send you the response directly um, to be as helpful as possible. But on behalf of the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition, Dr. Copeland Halpern, I cannot thank you enough for it giving of your time to help provide this valuable information that will help those that attended make sound decisions with their medical team. So I thank you so much for the information that you shared this evening. And I am very grateful for your time. And I would also just like to share with everyone, we have our next session for our ovarian cancer wellness symposium coming up next Thursday evening that we will be having a program on nutrition, which ties into your heart health, of course, um, nutrition throughout survivorship. And we also then will take a break once again for Thanksgiving for you to create beautiful memories with your loved ones and then connect one more time at the first Thursday in December. And we will have a special program on coping with cancer diagnosis in the holidays. And I want to thank Northwell Health as well as Merck for being um, supportive of this educational program and allowing us to enlighten, educate, and empower all of you with information that hopefully you will take to heart and take to action. So Dr. Copeland Halperin, thank you so much for an extraordinary presentation tonight. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. It was such a treat to be here, and I really appreciate everyone uh, you know, coming to uh, join us and all the great questions. So thank you very much.